Okay, this is our filtration video. Um, we had a little error on our chemistry one video. We left off the minus on the pH 10. Uh, it should be a minus 177 millivolts at a 59 millivolt pH per unit slope. As zero, um, pH of seven has a zero millivolt. The hydrogen ions inside the electrode are the same as the hydrogen ions on the outside, so there's no electrode potential. Um, as it goes, higher pH, more alkaline. The hydrogen ions are less, so a pH of eight will have a minus 59 millivolts, which means there's more hydrogen ions inside the electrode as outside. Whereas a pH of six will have a 59 millivolt positive, as there's more hydrogen ions outside the electrode as inside. The so pH probe only measures the hydrogen ion. That creates electric potential, which the meter reads. So a pH of four, you have a plus 177 millivolts. pH of 10 be minus 177 millivolts. <clears throat> um, that's something we left off the minus on that. Um, filtration, big thing with water at 39 degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees Celsius has maximum density. Uh, this means as it gets colder, it gets lighter. And as it gets warmer, it gets lighter. As water temperature drops, the viscosity increases. Uh, these are really important for filter operation. Backwash rates will change. Your filter water rates will change for the filter based on your temperature of the water. Basically with filtration, we're trying to move all the suspended solids. Any particulate in the water, we're trying to get out. Um, basically filters work differently in the winter as compared to the summer. Uh, some of the coagulants used, they have synthetic polymers. Alum is the old standby, aluminum sulfate. Use ferric sulfate, works better in a little bit higher pH waters. Um, the way the coagulants work, it's a reaction between the alkalinity and the water and the coagulant. It forms a metal hydroxide. Uh, this creates a positive charge and a lot of the suspended solids in the water are negative charge. So they'll stick together. They also will plate out on the particulate and make them stick together to form a flock. So the big thing, coagulants, they cause the suspended solids to stick together to form a flock, which can be filtered better. Okay, this is part two of our video. Um, this deals with coagulation mostly. This will pertain to your wheel or false bottom gravity filters as ultra filters don't use this. Um, Pre-coat filters, I'm not aware of them using any type of coagulants. Um, pressurized sand filters, possible, but mostly it's your wheel or false bottom gravity filters, kind of the industry standard. Um, big thing is the jar test. This will tell you how much coagulant to add. Uh, this shows a six jar mixing unit, it has a variable speed drive. Most of the time you just have one jar, maybe two. The big thing is you want to simulate plant conditions in your jar test and add different amounts of coagulants, different types. Um, if you're adding a coagulant aid, whatever you're using, you can try it right here in the lab and see what's going to give you the best results in the plant. Although you still have to make changes out in the plant based on run time and head loss and amount of turbidity coming through the filters. This shows that eight milligrams a liter, uh, really no results. 10, getting small amount of flock. 12 to 14, bigger flock. Uh, 16, 18, really large flock. Using too much chemical, and this can give you problems in your filter. So it's probably going to be 12 to 14 milligrams a liter. You'll shut this off, let it settle, see how fast these settle. Then run through a filter and see what gives you the best turbidity. So this is really handy for just checking the plant conditions on how much coagulant you need, uh, mixer speeds, you know, plant conditions. This changes throughout the year based on water quality. Spring runoff will change. If you're pulling out of a reservoir in the late summer, you'll have different changes. So anytime you have a water change, you run a jar test, just uh, see where you need to be in the plant or if you're trying new chemicals. Um, turbidity is the cloudy appearance of water caused by suspended solids and colloidal matter. This is what we're gonna take out with the filtration. Uh, it's measured in NTUs, nephilometric turbidity units. It's measured by a nephilometric deflect, detect, deflected light instrument. 
So you send a light beam down, and then it measures the amount of light reflected from the particles. Coagulation, you're adding a comp aluminum or ferric sulfate. It's a positive charged particles attached to a negative charge suspended solids. So basically, suspended solids are negative charge. Your coagulants are positive charge, so it causes them to stick together. And also, the coagulants in the water, they look for a particulate to stick to. So they'll stick on small particles, bacteria stuff. So they're, the clumping together of the small particles is called flocculation. Uh, slang term is flock. Flocculation is the gathering together of the coagulated particles. So this is the result of your coagulation chemicals. They can be really quite large, like snowflakes in the water, really impressive. Or they can be a very, very small pinpoint flock. What you're doing is taking the small particles and making them big enough to filter out efficiently. Uh, disinfection, you can use chlorine gas. This isn't used much anymore due to the hazards. Uh, ozone is used with ferric sulfate, which is pretty good system. Uh, you have sodium hypochlorite. Uh, it's like bleach. This is used a lot. It's fairly safe to handle and works well. You have chlorine dioxide. I don't believe that's used too much anymore. Uh, chlorine first added is used up. This is called the demand. It oxidizes uh, chemicals in the water and organics tied up. Chlorine in excess is known as free chlorine. This is the chlorine that ensures proper disinfection in the systems. This is a drinking water system. You want to maintain 0.2 milligrams a liter free chlorine in the system just to make sure that you have good disinfection. Uh, this diagram just shows a plant using gravity filters. You have your coagulate coming in, chlorine, coagulant aids, raw water coming in, goes to a mixed tank. Chemicals are mixed up. From here it goes out to the settling basin. Uh, it drops down to the bottom. You have paddle wheels that slowly mix the water, try to form, main, form good flock formation. The whole purpose of this is to make good flock formation and get all the particulate large enough so it'll come out in the filter. On the top you'll have your trough that collects the water and it goes over here to your filter where the particulates remove the flock. From there it flows down to a clear well. This would be the filtered water that's set up the distribution system here. Okay, this is the actual filter part of this. Um, we have four different filters. Ultra filtration. It's kind of the newer style. It's one step above RO's uh, pre-coat filters. They use a uh, media to do the filtering. The sand filter, pressurized sand filters. And then the Wheeler false bottom gravity filter. These filters here rely on the coagulation to work well. Um, basically on this filter, you have a concrete floor that has pyramid depressions in it. Uh, there's ceramic balls fit in these depressions. There's three millimeter or 76 millimeter balls and there's some smaller balls. On top of this you have your layers of gravel. Uh, there are three inch layers, 76 milliliter layers of gravel. Then you have a sand bed. And on top of this you have your anthrophilt. This is a hard crushed coal. Uh, it's between 1.7 and 2 millimeters. Somewhere around a quarter inch. It's pretty uniform size. This is where all your filtering takes place. On top of this, you have your surface sweep. It uses high pressured water just to mix the top of the bed up to break up any mud balls. Um, so sludge formation helps to do the backwash more efficiently. Then you have your backwash trough. This maintains a level in the filter when you backwash. So you can get a good expansion of the bed without blowing media out. Also, the water comes in with a plug valve. Uh, comes on this side of the filter. It comes across the backwash trough. This way, put how you fill the filter, bring water in. Also has a drain valve, so when you backwash it comes out that way also. Uh, these filters work really good with the coagulation. Uh, it takes out all the flock particles. Here's some different conditions in the bed. This is how you want it to work. A little bit of flock formation on top. A lot of it's caught in the bed. The bed has a slight negative charge, so they will trap the flock particles. If they're too large, too soft, they can actually break through the bed and um, work through here. So you need a really good flock particle to work well. 
That's why the too large a flock may not work that well. And the too small may not work well either. Too much flock will give you a seal off the top of the bed or mud balls. Um, this happens if you have a high DP across the bed. You can get air binding, cold water, lower pressure will drop, cause the air, dissolved air in the water to drop out, uh, form little bubbles in the bed. So when you backwash, it can actually tear the media up, blow up the media up pretty good. Um, over here, there's not enough alum added. Uh, the flock particles are not sticking. It's coming through the filter and it'll show up as turbidity in the effluent. Down here, we have mud balls formed. That wasn't backwashed good enough. Backwash flow rates are too low. Uh, time is too, need more time on it. Here's a destroyed bed. You have air trap down here and hoping the backwash valve up. The air comes through here and blow the balls out of the bed and mix up the gravel and the media. At this point, you gotta dig this whole thing back out and re-bed it, which is a fairly substantial job. So always make sure this is full of water before you start backwashing, just so you don't damage the beds in these. Here's the normal, you have your balls down here and it's pretty clean, little, here's your ceramic thimble. Down here you have your effluent, uh, flow control valve maintains the flow through the filter. Uh, this is like a 13 by 28 filter. Could around about 1600 gallons a minute or so. You have your influent coming in and your effluent coming out. High influent comes in down here. Use your water level be up here. So you have your head loss, which is just a measure of the DP across your bed. You'll watch that. Um, you watch your effluent turbidity and then the runtime. These will be some of the factors you'll use for backwashing the filter. If you have a short runtime and a high DP, uh, you've probably got too much alum to plug in your filter. And if you get a high effluent turbidity without a long runtime, you probably need more coagulant. It's coming through the filter. And you always want to backwash them before you take them out of service for maintenance. Uh, basically, when you backwash, you need enough flow to get this bed to expand very well. Too much flow will blow out the media through the backwash trough it out. So you can actually wash out your anther felt by too much flow. Not enough, you won't get good cleaning in the bed. And you get mud balls forming. Like I say, different times of year, you can change your backwash rates. The winter time, you won't use as much backwash water. Summertime, you need more because the water is less dense. Uh, it's less viscous in the summer. So you need more backwash. How often you backwash also depends on how well your settling basin's working. Are you dropping a lot of material out over here? Uh, depends on the flow rates, really high flow rates for the plant. You may not have the settling time. You may be picking up more in your filters. Different times of year, the amount of sediment loading coming in. You could have really high turbidity water coming in. You can have to do a lot more filtering. So it kind of changes throughout the year on your filters. The big thing with these, you have to maintain the backwash flow at a certain level. Uh, the effluent flow you need to maintain. When you backwash, make sure there's no air in the beds. Usually there's not because this is as low as the water goes. This is where you drain the backwash at. It goes down the top of the backwash trough to waste. Then you bring your water back through the bed. Bed expands up to here somewhere. Scrubs the anthrophilt particles. Gets out all the flock. Cleans it. And then the waste product comes out here. Be kind of a muddy colored water. The problem with these use a lot of water. This water has to go to waste. Now you have an alum product to deal with. They're kind of not used as much anymore just because of the problems of dealing with the waste and also using the water. The water can be reclaimed, but some places don't have a lot of water to use. In the older days, these were used a lot. They give you very good quality water. It takes a little bit of operation uh, finesse to get these to work well. But you have to go down and clean the surface sweep nozzles every so often. and. Um, just keeping on operation, the flock, how it's forming, how it's going. If you have a really big flock, you could be getting this condition going on. So your jar testing and this operation experience can tell you about where you need to be on your coagulant. And you need to track your effluent turbidity, head loss, runtime, all this on log sheets. 
and this can give you an idea how well your filter's working, how much your, how your coagulate's working. Um, filter aids, they can help extend your runtime. They go in your filter. They cause your flock particles to stick better in the anthrophilt. And there's, there's all kinds of products out here nowadays for filter aids, um, coagulants. I don't know if there's any two plants that actually run the same or use the same chemicals. Depends on the water quality, the pH, alkalinity, time of the year, um, disposal costs, you know, what are the regulations for getting rid of alum waste. You know, you may have to use a different type of coagulant. So there's a lot to this. It's, this is a really super quick overview. But it's just some basic stuff on false bottom. This is kind of the first filter I ran. I kind of like them. Uh, your pressurized sand filter. Basically, water comes in. The filtering action, a lot of it's done with the particulate in the water. It forms a layer or it forms in here. So it actually does a lot of the filtering is the particulate itself. The sand grabs a lot of it. So these have to run a little bit and then they get better water quality as they run. Now uh, these you backwash in, backwash water comes in the bottom through nozzles. These are graded beds of gravel. Then here's your sand, uh, backwashes out. Uses pressurized water. These just use gravity. You got your head up here, the height of the water across this thing, really what drives it. These were good for smaller plant filtrations. Um, they don't give you probably that great of water, but they work well for a lot of processes. Uh, here we have the pre-coat filter. This uses diatomaceous earth, cellulose, pack, product-activated carbon, you use different types of media. Uh, this works, you have a stainless steel tube in here with holes in it. Then inside there's a sock, cloth sock that fits in here. This holds on the, the media, your filter media will stay inside this cloth. This one, we're just showing a diatomaceous earth. Um, the water comes in, goes inside the sock, and then it flows through there. And your filter media takes all the particulate. Also, the, as the particulate builds up on the media, it gives you more filtration also. Then you have your filtered water comes out. Raw water comes in, filtered water out. After a set time, or a pressure drop gets high across these, then you'll backwash it. Uh, the basic way this works, you have your clean water tank goes through a pump, you reverse the flow. It comes down the outside, and then it goes through the stainless steel tube, through the cloth, and then washes off the media, your diatomaceous earth. This goes out to a decant tank. I let it settle the diatomaceous earth and suspended solids that you picked up drop out. You can reclaim the water. Then you have to put a new coat back on these socks. So you have a diatomaceous earth tank. Um, that's kind of what we used. The size of the diatomaceous earth particles and the amount going on the filters really affects these as runtime. You can actually almost plug them off by putting too much on. So the tank, you'll take a 100 milliliter sample, let it settle, then measure how many milliliters of diatomaceous earth you have in the solution. One to two is probably good, maybe a little bit more depending on the size of the the DE. So the tank flows down here through the pump, uh, goes on the inside of the sock filter. The socks will grab the diatomaceous earth and form a new filter coat inside. The water is returned back to the clean water tank. You can tell if you have a bad sock if this water starts getting murky. If you get di diatomaceous earth back, you have a bad sock filter. Or you may have too fine a diatomaceous earth also. So the size of the diatomaceous earth you're using is huge. Um, it can change how well these things run. But they work really very well. Your product coming out is your diatomaceous earth and the suspended solids you picked up. So you don't really have any chemicals to deal with on these. I mean, you can stack a whole bunch of these modules to get however much filtration you need. Uh, the big problem with these, water hammering them, hitting them hard, damaging, blowing up these stainless steel tubes are kind of fragile and the sock filters inside. But if you don't water hammer these and treat them well, they, they do work very well. Over here we have the ultra filtration. We're not going to talk too much about today, just kind of mention them. Um, these are capable of rejecting 
0.0005 micron and larger molecules and particles. These work very well. A lot of cities are using these for water filtration. It takes out the Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Gives you really good log reduction in your water coming out. Um, they have little tubes in here. The 1.3 millimeters OD, 0.7 millimeters ID. It's a step above ROs. Um, your membranes are characterized by the pore size and molecular weight cutoff. That's measured in Daltons. There's different membranes um, for what you're using these for. But they do give you a, a fairly good water outlet. The only problem with these, you have to chemically clean these tubes or like an RO membrane. They will plug up with different substances in the water. You have to use acid, caustic, cleaning agents. So that's something you have to dispose of. But these work pretty good. Like anything, it depends on your water, what you what you need to use to clean up the water with. One thing about water is no two waters are the same, and there can be a lot of different things that affect your plant operation. Like up here, your alkalinity, your pH, this determines your coagulants or what you're using, uh, what's in the water. If you have a lot of irons and stuff, it could be a problem on this. A lot of organic molecules, you know, this won't pick up much for organic molecules. This will let organic molecules through. This might grab some stuff, color in the water, some humic acids and stuff, you know, your coagulants may pick up, but then do you really want to dispose of all the waste from it? As waste, water gets tighter to use, less water, and disposal costs become more. That's really going to change a lot of the filtration. <clears throat> These work really well, uh, water plants. So the future is probably more towards this type of a, a filter in um, commercial water treatment for cities, just due to the cost of water and dealing with the waste products.